Hi, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Schaefer, the Creative Director for uh, Licensed Publishing at Delray. Uh, and I'm Tom Holler. I'm an editor on the licensing team at Delray. Um, and for a, almost the last five years, it'll be five years this December, um, Elizabeth and I have worked together on Star Wars books. Um, welcome think, to our panel. Yeah, welcome to our panel. We're, you know, we're sorry that we can't be with everyone, but we can still be with everyone, you know, in a, in a manner of speaking. Um, and so we wanted to do this kind of virtual Q&A about Star Wars books and working on Star Wars. And uh, if you all enjoy it, then we will totally do more of them. We will find more ways to bring you virtual events throughout the year. And um, if you hate it, we'll never do it again. That's true. If you hate it, we'll never do it again. Um, but please be nice in your feedback. <laughs> yes. Um, but anyway, uh, this uh, should be a lot of fun. We have a bunch of questions that you have submitted. We really appreciate everyone submitting questions. Uh, we have some other topics we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, but uh, Most of the questions are uh, things that we can't answer yet. There were some awesome, like, thoughts about um, characters you wanted to see again or novels you wanted to see. And... I agree with all of those things, and we'll probably be talking about some of that stuff soon, but most of these questions today are going to be, uh, you know, about editorial process, what it's like to work on Delray books, uh, and things of that nature. Yeah, and, you know, the, the, the cool thing is that actually a bunch of people did ask a specific question about a specific type of project that we actually can talk about, and that is um, audio originals um, coming off of the awesome Dooku Jedi Lost book audiobook that we did last year with Kevin Scott and all of our friends on the audio team. And they said, are we going to get another one of those? Are you going to do another one? Please do another one. And so we decided to do another one, right, Elizabeth? Uh, yeah. And I think, you know, there's this character, I don't know if you guys have heard of her, uh, Dr. Afra. I think, I think she has a few fans out there. I think she is her number one fan, but all y'all can be her number two fans. And so uh, it's coming from author Sarah Kuhn later this year, July 21st. She is adapting the amazing Kieran Gillen run of the Darth Vader comic to be an Afro-focused story. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. And the thing that was most exciting is we were sitting around and we were talking about actually after Dooku, we said, well, we have to do another one of these. It was so much fun to do. Everyone seemed to really enjoy it. It was, it was great. And we were trying to figure out what the next project should be. And we just glommed onto Afra because we've all loved Afra. We've wanted to do stuff with Afra for a long time. Everyone loves telling Afra stories. And we looked at that original Vader run where Afra is introduced. And the thing that excited me the most was, you know, Afra is a big part of that story, but there's a ton of time where she's not present on the panels. You know, she goes off to do a mission for Vader if she's off doing something. And you're like, what is Afra doing right now? And then she'll come back and she'll tell something Vader. Something like, badass is what she's been exactly. doing, obviously. She, she's like, I went and did this crazy thing. And you get really excited, but you didn't see everything. And so there was so much opportunity to kind of go into between the panels there and fill in the rest of that story. So that even if you love that original Vader run, even if you've read it cover to cover a bunch of times, there's so much stuff that we get to add that wasn't in that original uh, Karen Gillan work. Yeah, you'll see a lot of favorite faces. Uh, I know I'm personally very excited for more Santa Staros content. Uh, and what's really cool about this audio original is like Dooku, it will be a fully voice cast. So um, there'll be a bunch of different actors portraying all the roles. Um, so it'll be the like to listen to. Yeah. And you may be wondering like how, wait, exactly how are they doing that given everything that's going on in the world? Um, and what's awesome is first of all, the people who work on the audiobooks, our friends at, Star, our, at Random House Audio are literal wizards. So they just make crazy things literally. happen. Literally. Um, but the other thing is that we have this amazing um, community of narrators and voice talent who have studios at home or have the ability at home to kind of record books. So even though they can't record all in the same room like we did for Dooku Jedi Lost, which was super great, they're still all going to be able to record this together um, and then bring it to you this summer, which is super exciting and super fun. Um, so that, that's how it's going to happen, even though we're all at home. And one more awesome thing about this book is the author herself, Sarah Kuhn. Um, She's just the greatest. I think she maybe loves Afra more than anyone I know. Um, and we actually have a video that she recorded for y'all talking a little bit more about the project. Hi, I am Sarah Kuhn, and I'm so excited to tell you that I wrote the Star Wars audiobook original Afra, starring everyone's favorite rogue archaeologist, Dr. Afra. Our story is based on this series, 
of Darth Vader comics by Kieran Gillen and Salvador La Roca. And it's all about what happens when Afra ends up working for Darth Vader and has all kinds of adventures. And now I'm going to read you something because I tried to memorize this and it did not go very well. I love Afra because she is the definition of chaos. She never looks before she leaps. She is always seeking thrills and she is charming to a fault. You never really know exactly what she's going to do, which means that personally, I think she's having the most fun of anyone in the Star Wars galaxy. In writing this story for the audio format, I really wanted to put us firmly in Aphra's POV. What we hear is all filtered through her very colorful lens. And she is, of course, the most unreliable narrator ever. I had such an amazing time expanding this story to delve into her relationships, her past, her feelings, even though she would probably be the first person to tell you that she doesn't have feelings. And while Afra is to me the most exciting character, there are a lot of other exciting characters in this story. Um, her favorite murderous droid sidekicks, Triple Zero and BT, her old flame, Sonastaros, they are all in there. And this will be a dynamic audiobook, complete with a full cast of your favorite Star Wars narrators and possibly some exciting new voices. Afra will be published as a full cast audiobook July 21st by Penguin Random House Audio with Del Rey and Disney Lucasfilm. Stay tuned for more information this summer, and I really hope you enjoy it. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, as you said, that audiobook original is going to be coming out July 21st. Uh, so look for future details on that. Yeah, that is going to be fantastic. Um, and now what we're going to do is we are going to transition and answer a bunch of questions that all of you sent in. We have scoured the internet far and wide um, via the hashtag Ask Star Wars Books and collected questions from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all over the place. Um, and we have seen these questions but we may not have you know prepared total answers so i have uh, flawless answers yeah, for th every th question this is be fun. Wow. so i get to go first right oh okay well oh. I, I could go let me okay. go you okay first. so the first question is from karen on facebook and they ask when editing what main thing do you take into consideration canon character or storyline yeah well see now i know why you wanted to go first because like this is a hard question it's um, very hard ha 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 uh so obviously all three of these things have their place in a story, but for me, it starts with a character because for a couple of reasons, ultimately, you know, uh, uh, the world or the story that I'm experiencing, the plot, the, the themes, all of those things, it all comes down to whether or not I want to actually spend the time with the characters who are experiencing all those things. If I don't want to spend time with the characters, the actual storyline, how it connects to the other stories, you know, the canon connectivity, the references, all those things are nice, but they kind of play second fiddle. And so for me, it always starts with the character. So if the character and their voice is really strong and they're intriguing and engaging and they have an incredible arc, that is going to carry me through the rest of the story. It's also for me as an editor, the thing that's kind of the hardest thing to crack so, you know, if you've got a, a story that's got some pacing challenges or, you know, you don't have the kind of depth of the canon connections, the references you want in there, those things can be tweaked and fixed through the revising and editing process. Not easy because, you know, writing is difficult, but, you know, through enough iterations, you can get there. If a character is not working or if a character isn't spot on, that's a much bigger challenge to address. Yeah. And so for me, I'm always starting on page one with how do I feel about the characters? And I think that's one of the coolest things about how we work at Del Rey. Um, you mentioned how hard it is to crack character, which I completely agree. And I really like that our team works very collaboratively where, you know, obviously someone is the lead editor on a book and um, as kind of the creative driving force between it, but we all read every draft of every story together and have meetings to discuss things um, so that we have a variety of opinions chiming in on the book um, to make sure those three elements of canon, character, and storyline are nicely balanced. Yeah, see, that sounded really good. That was, you know, it's not, a, not a difficult question at all, but that was really a really good one, a good start. Um, Second question. Tell me more about myself, Tom. I know, exactly. <laughs> that, that, that's what we want. More questions about us. Less questions about us, more questions about Star Wars. Absolutely. Um, next question comes from uh, Jonathan, also on Facebook. Uh, Jonathan says, greetings, Del Rey. What is the process for deciding what references to put into books, um, such as references in Resistance Reborn or Clone Wars references in Catalyst? Is it up to the author? Is it from Lucasfilm? You guys as editors, story group, where does it all come from? 
Uh, I think the best answer is all of the above, right? Um, I think that oftentimes, you know, an author will get really excited about potentially including a character that they love or someone from canon that they think will be a perfect fit for this role. And so the idea comes from there or the editor, you know, Tom or myself uh, might think of a, a perfect person that might slot in from this obscure, you know, oh, Jackson, Jackson the not rabbit would totally fit in Be right here. Be still my heart. Be still my heart. <laughs> uh, but a lot of times those suggestions do come from Lucasfilm and Story Group because they have this amazing bird's eye view of everything that's going on in canon right now. So they'll be able to say, hey, there's this thing that hasn't released yet that's happening at the same time in the timeline or that um, really fits into the themes of this very well. Why don't we'll give you the information you need to be able to work this into the storyline? And that's something like we really appreciate from them. Yeah, and it's it's also really important that it ends up being this big collaborative effort. So a lot of times, as you said, it comes from everywhere and we actually will put all of the suggestions together and then look at them um, just because Jonathan asked. Um, for Resistance Reborn, you know, we talked about how this was a little bit like we're going to bring in characters from all over the place. All these different stories are going to come together to help put the Resistance back together. And obviously, if you think about the characters we included, the list of characters we included is like about a third as long as the list of characters we could have included. And the list of characters that we honestly thought about. And it it came down to we made this massive list and then we actually sat down and thought through like which characters make the most sense for the story because ultimately as nice as a fun reference is as cool as it can be to have like a super awesome easter egg it still needs to fit into the story if it sticks out like a sore thumb that's not really going to work too well so for something like resistance reborn it was really great to put all these characters together and then actually talk through would it make the best sense to have this character in there or this character or what is the cool storytelling opportunity um so and that's actually one of the most fun things to do is to just be like hey we need a character for this slot and then get references from all over the place and tons of different people's feedback and then figure out the best one um, so they come from everywhere um, uh, our next question is from at mandralorgana uh what is your favorite cover among all the published star wars books so far uh, my answer to this one is definitely, um, I don't know if you've seen the Celebration exclusive edition of Master and Apprentice um, by Jama Jurabayev. Um, it's got Anna, or not Anakin, uh, Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon back, back with lightsabers raised and an entire horde of people uh, charging them down. And it's just absolutely epic. And I love those characters and I love that book. Yeah, it's a beautiful, like, kind of almost watercolory kind of uh, mm -hmm. image. Um, it's it's amazing. I remember when we first had the idea for it and then um, brought Jama in, um, that first time we saw, like, a uh, sketch of it, it was just, like, even in sketch form, you were like, oh, my God, this is going to yeah, be this amazing. This is the one. Um, I know Cl Claudia actually asked for um, if we could make her, like, a big printer poster of that image for her to hang in her house. So I assume that's somewhere out there. Yeah, we totally will do that. If, you're, if you become a Star Wars <laughs> author, we will make you a poster of your book cover. Um, for me... Um, all of the, the convention edition ones, the special edition covers that we do, obviously, are tons of fun because they let us play around with things. But one of my favorite covers, and it's really because of just how simple it is and it just plays with scale really easily, is the cover for Catalyst. Because mm. you just get like the massive, unbelievable scale of the Death Star and just the colors, the green, and then the silver and the black, like all working together on the cover. It's really simple in terms of the elements, but... Um, it's really striking and really awesome. It kind of tells you just, it's just gives you everything you need to know about the book in, you know, two seconds. Of Didn't that. Scott Beale make that one? Yeah, our, so, uh, our art director? That's right. So Scott Beale is our art director. He is um, among the many other talented wizards that we work with. Um, and he helps us develop all of our covers. And that one, yes, he, I think, just developed himself based on some, you know, uh, basic reference and style guide art that we were able to kind of tweak and apply effects. And again, he did his wizardry too. Um, and it would like print it over foil too, yeah, which oh, I love when I can print over so, foil on covers. Yeah. If you, can, if, if you haven't seen the Catalyst cover, go, go seek that one out. Um, I dig that one a lot. Um, all right. Uh, it's my turn, right? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So this one also from Twitter from DTLA17 um, asks, can you touch on the creation process for the New Hope certain point of view from a certain point of view? It seems like it was quite the undertaking. It was. Um, also, how are anthologies approached from an editing and creation perspective versus a standard novel? Don't do anthologies. Just, Just do them. Just it, stop. It, step one, thinking about doing an anthology. Step two, stop. No, I'm kidding. It is obviously an amazing book, and I love that book, and I'm so glad we did that book. But I think 
I think it's fair to say when we were starting out, we we didn't realize the ambition of the project fully. Nope, it's the uh, best bad idea fair. we've ever had. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because we thought, um, I think uh, this was just about when I was coming on with Delray for the first time and um, the anniversary was coming up. We wanted to do something special, something that was a retelling of A New Hope, but in a new and interesting way. And, you know, somebody had the bad, good idea to retell the book from the point of view of all these minor characters. Because I think that's a huge part of what people love about Star Wars is that it feels like there's it's this lived in world where you just look at anyone in the background and they have an entire life, an entire story um, that's going on around them. And they don't, they don't care about this Luke Skywalker guy, they have things to do. Um, and then, and then I don't know why we thought, oh, it's the 40th anniversary. There should be 40 stories from 43, ultimately, different authors. Um, just, uh, as, you, as you say, a, a big undertaking. But I think it worked out, about, worked out really well. Um, my favorite story from that time is I was writing a, an email to all of the authors and um, uh, talking about like how big the page count was getting and it's all so good I'm so proud of you my beautiful children and I had accidentally typed it's becoming quite a I meant to say tome and I accidentally typed tomb so I think that was the the Freudian slip that um, describes the the challenges inherent that in that pro process but I mean I wouldn't trade it for anything it's an amazing book yeah, no, it's it was it's definitely one of the most fulfilling projects I think that we've gotten to work on since we started doing this. Um, and it really was this kind of ridiculous idea because we were just like, oh, we'll get one author to tell the story of A New Hope from all these different side characters. And then we just somebody was like, but it's 40 years, it should be 40. And again, it was one of those, we said yes before we really thought about it. And then we <laughs> sat down and the fact that for a book, an editorial project, the first thing you do is open Microsoft Excel, you know that, uh, <laughs> Things are about to get intense. We started to break down the movie and started to break it down. And it was still, it was like uproarious and hilarious when we were starting to think about the possibilities for stories. Um, and ultimately the ones that we ended up with like surpassed even all of the expectations and thoughts we could have had about it. But it was, it was a monster undertaking. Um, and really the way that you parse it out is you sort of break it down into breaking down the film into bigger scenes, breaking down the possible scenes and the possible characters, making sure that the ones that overlap, if they overlap, that you, you know, have things in place so that if someone's name has to be tweaked or like, don't kill that person on page two because they got to appear in the story 10 pages later. Um, <laughs> it's basically just like the same thing as doing a novel, but 40 times in a row. So you just do it 40 <laughs> times. Um, so yeah, don't do it. But, don't but do also, it. if you do do it, it's, it's super fun. Um, and I think we've, we've probably had m more fun doing that project than any other project. And we have a lot of fun doing lots of different projects. That one probably has the most fun. I want to read the next one because I like the username. Fine. It's from Mark, uh, Matt, sorry, Matt Harrington at Darth Durango, which is a spacious luxury Darth. Uh, they ask, which Star Wars book character do you feel is closest to you? Mm -hmm. Which Star Wars book character do you feel is closest to who you would be in Star Wars? Um, I mean, like, as much as I'd like to say that I'd be a Jedi, I think the real answer is that I'm probably more like J the Jawa from, from a certain point of view, oddly enough. So just like someone who enjoys stories and wants a quiet, relatively <laughs> place to read and like... I like that a lot. I know. It's yeah, Griffin the McElroy's Jawa. story, right? That is. That yeah. is Griffin McElroy's. Um, it's a really Aww. great one. Highly recommend. Either Jot the Jawa or... Um, Wedge Antilles, but not like, you know, Rogue Squadron, like leading fighter pilots into, into space battles. Specifically Wedge from his first chapter in Resistance Reborn, where he's just like living on a quiet farm that's more or less a hobbit hole with a well-stocked uh -huh. kitchen, raising birds, like just trying to like... Just trying I mean, to your apartment the... is basically a hobbit hole, and I mean that in the best way possible. It it's is. Yeah. There are a concerning number of green walls, I noticed when I was trying to find a good place to do this. <laughs> Thank you for not shooting against a green wall time. I just value your safety. Thanks. <laughs> um, my answer, um, you know, uh, similarly, I would love to think I'm like a Jazz Amari or like some badass bounty hunter who um, always gets their person and all that, but I'm, I'm not at all that. I think maybe who I would like to think I'm like is Peekpa the Ewok, who is adorable, good at tech things, people under Un underestimate her and uh i think she's probably a bad speller which is my defining characteristic as tom will tell you so you know me and Pipa. 
That's just because people value Galactic Basic over the Ewok language. So that's really not, that's not on you <laughs> or on them, Tifa. Yeah. honestly. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, Good that's really just the bias of Galactic Basic right there. Mm -hmm. All right. I get to, I get to ask the next one. This is okay. um, from uh, at Logan Bayer. Um, is there anything that makes writing a Star Wars book different than writing a regular old novel? Um, many things. Um, lightsabers. 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 Yeah. Um, uh, the metric system, uh, that's, a, that's one that trips people up all the time. Star Wars is the metric system, so don't be trying to put like inches and miles and all those things into your book. Um, we will catch them, and we will tell you not to do that. Um, it's actually the first thing I do when I open up a book uh, manuscript is I yeah. start doing a control F for inches, miles, feet, all those things. Yards. Uh, yards, yards will get you. You'll forget to look for the yards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so metric system people. Yeah. Um, but I mean, uh, in a, more seriously, I think... Um, the greatest thing about Star Wars that makes it different is, is that collaboration that we've talked about, that um, Star Wars isn't any one person's story. We're just kind of all working together to bring this galaxy to life. So that's pretty cool that, um, that you get to work together with so many different people. But also lightsabers. But also lightsabers. <laughs> also lightsabers. Uh, this next question is from at Andrew Yader 16, who asks, how do you assign the right author to the right project? Um, and a similar question was from Sarah underscore H115, who asks, do you reach out to authors or can authors reach out to you? Yeah, so um, we, can, we get these questions all the time. We get them from prospective authors. We get them from readers. We, we get to ask this all the time. And um, what it comes down to is, A, we totally love authors reaching out to us and telling us they want to write Star Wars. Um, authors do that. Either they just tweet at us or they'll come visit us when we're allowed to leave our houses and go to conventions or um, <laughs> through agents or whatever. Times. Yeah. Um, <laughs> through agents or whatever. Um, send us emails all the time saying, I would love to write Star Wars. I'd love to do some of Star Wars. Star Wars means a lot to me. And we love hearing that because one of the things that we have to do when we're going to find authors is we want to find people who have a real passion for Star Wars and for whom we'd be excited about doing it. So having them come to us gets ha is, you know, half the work already done for us, which we appreciate. Um, and then what it really comes down to is what we want to make sure happens is when someone comes to write a Star Wars book, that they get to have an amazing experience writing a Star Wars book. And that means writing a Star Wars book that speaks to their writing style, their sensibilities as a writer, what they care about in Star Wars, what they're passionate about in Star Wars. So um, we oftentimes, ha you know, have to wait a little while to find that right story because we want an author to have a great experience because if they don't, they're not going to write a great Star Wars book and then you as a reader won't have a great experience reading it because it's sort of a proof is in the pudding sort of thing. So a lot of times an author will reach out to us and say, hey, I would love to write Star Wars. And we'll say, we would also love for you to write Star Wars, but it <laughs> might take a little while for us to find that exact right project that works for them just because we want to put authors in the best position to succeed. They'll have the most fun writing. We'll have the most fun working with them. Readers will have the most fun reading. And so that's really what it comes down to a lot. Um, it actually what it comes down to pretty much all the time. Um, okay. All right. I have to read this next one to you. <laughs> I'm looking at the Google Doc. Here, I'm pulling back the curtain here, viewers. Yes. Uh, this is There's from a very Pat. professional Google Doc. <laughs> from at Unusual Table asks, has anyone at the office ever lost a story draft? And then the note beneath it just says, Tom will vamp. Uh, vamp, Tom, vamp. <laughs> Yes, uh, have lost a story draft before. Not in the way you think. I didn't like leave it at an airport or like, you know, accidentally like mail it to like, you know, Entertainment Weekly or something like that. Um, so uh, as we've sort of been talking about, because it's this big collaborative process, making a Star Wars book involves getting feedback from a number of different places and obviously over kind of a couple of different rounds. We'll give feedback on an outline. We'll give feedback on a first draft of a manuscript, et cetera, et cetera. And so ultimately what has to happen at some point is you will probably have to um, collate a bunch of information together. Mm. So the dark to, side of collaboration. Yes. yes. So you'll have to collate a bunch of um, comments from Word or wherever together into one file. Um, and so for a particular book, I believe actually it was Bloodline, our first project together, oh. or Bloodline, I was doing that. I was, I was collating all of the comments together from a couple different places into one file so that we could get rid of redundancies because an author doesn't need to see the same five people being like, hey, this sentence is unclear. Like, we don't need like an office space TPS report situation there, like just you know, <laughs> one time. So I was putting it all together and I got through the whole book. You know, it's over 300 pages, got through the whole thing, and then something happened and it crashed and I lost everything. 
I oh lost all the collation. No. I had to start it completely over. No. Um, it took me more than a day of doing just to do it all a second time. It was pretty awful. Um, I definitely learned my lesson about don't think your computer won't crash because it absolutely will. Don't think you shouldn't have saved that extra time because you absolutely should. Um, some people might have seen it on Twitter, but when we were working on the Rise of Skywalker novelization, in part because I learned my lesson years before, you might have seen pictures of a bunch of stacks of papers with like cat tabs on it, little cat tabs. And that's because for that, I actually made a redundancy of writing out a bunch of the, the edits and changes on physical paper just because then, mm -hmm. you know, my paper can't crash. I suppose the pen <laughs> could crash if it exploded, but that didn't happen. Um, so that's happened and that wasn't great. Um, but you know, but see, live. this is you know your pain is becoming practical life advice for Absolutely. for this panel. Yes, who, learn. Who do you learn get from practical practical information on this. Yeah, yeah. Learn learn from me. All right, so I get to ask this next one, which is also from Unusual Table, and I really think actually the secret here was just have a really awesome handle or something, and you'll. <laughs> This table, um, it's so unusual. Yes. Um, so this one, we're gonna, we're just we're gonna pivot ever so slightly into some. Uh, I'm going to say slightly more silly questions, but we love silly questions. As you can tell, we love silly things. Mm -hmm. um, we are ourselves very silly. Um, I mean, so, well, didn't we spend a whole afternoon like sorting um, members of the Justice League into what was that Hogwarts houses? I thought that story was going to have a Star Wars ending by the end, but then it didn't. So yes, we do silly things all the time. I think we were at San Diego Comic-Con in the Star Wars booth when we that's did that. It. So that's how yeah, we got Yeah, okay. It's uh, okay. We gotta, yeah, there's a lot of time to pass when you're at a Comic-Con booth. It's not all uh, <laughs> long lines and, uh, and con editions, um, though it often is. All right, so back to Unusual Table. Um, what do you think Eli Vanto of Thrawn and Thrawn Treason uh, fame, uh, what do you think Eli Vanto's opinion is on breakfast cereal? This seems like a super crucial question. We better make sure we give well, an answer. Well, I have a real canonical answer. Well, okay, not quite about breakfast cereal, but I do not know his opinion on that. Although I think he would like it because he's like in charge of shipping lanes, right? Cereal is something that can keep for a long time. It has uh, regularly shaped boxes, so yes. But um, I do know from the man himself, Timothy Zahn, that Eli Vanto's uh, favorite flavor of Pop-Tart is strawberry. This is a real email that I have received. <laughs> yeah. Um, favorite pop tart is strawberry. Yeah. I did not which receive is... that email, which makes me feel less close mm -hmm. to Tim. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He specifically is like, never tell Tom this. So it's next time we have an editorial secret. conversation about, <laughs> I don't know, Thrawn Ascendancy number two, we're going to have like a 10 minute deep dive into breakfast and breakfast cereal and pop tarts before we get to anything. I know. And then you won't be caught out on the next panel, Tom. Yeah. Oh. What can I say? You got to pre be prepared. Yeah. Uh, also, apologies if you hear the sirens going by. We are at home in the real world. In as, New York City. Yeah, in New York City um, as all this um, stuff happens. So that it, is, it is real. It's live. This is not like a facsimile of a house. I don't know why I said that. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> uh, let's, next question. Yeah, let's get to the next question. It's uh, from at Shadiest C on Twitter who asks, what sort of shenanigans can we expect from a young Thrawn in Chaos Rising perhaps? Oh, well, first of all, we can remove the perhaps because there will definitely be shenanigans. <laughs> um, uh, though, though, I will say the word perhaps does not appear in Chaos Rising all that much. I know it appeared like every other word in Thrawn Treason, which was totally <laughs> like not intended. It just kind of happened that way. Um, it's one of those things that you don't think about. And then the day the book comes out, everyone on Twitter is just you know, memes about perhaps for, for forever. And you're like, what the heck happened? Um, but anyway, it only appears like a half dozen times. I may have counted. Um, but anyway, back to the actual question. Shenanigans, um, many shenanigans, and most importantly, the kind of shenanigans that will annoy many of the Chiss, particularly many of the mm -hmm. Chiss who are not part of the same house, the house myth that Thrawn is part of. So um, yeah, you can look forward to that. That's my favorite thing about Thrawn, when he is just absolutely driving someone crazy, and his veneer never cracks. He's just being cold and logical, and the person on the other side of the conversation is getting more and more frustrated. It's amazing. Yeah, so I mean, you know, we've seen Thrawn uh, and his shenanigans annoy just like a singular person in the form of either like the Emperor, or Vader, or Krennic. Uh, or Tarkin, uh, or really anyone else high ranking in the Empire. Yeah. Now we get to see him do it with like the entire Ascendancy. Um, but the entire Ascendancy is not bothered by his shenanigans, just a good amount of the part that really matters. Um, yeah. But anyway. He's not, he's not good at the politics game, Thrawn. Gotta, gotta get that down, bud. No, he's not. But 
we'll find out. What's next? The next uh, question. What's next? Uh, from uh, at or a Dylan uh, Dev. So between High Republic, Dooku Jedi Lost, I guess we could throw the recently announced Afrin here, and from a certain point of view, there seem to be a number of projects that don't fit the usual novel publishing procedure, uh, at least to my untrained eye. What sort of unique challenges and opportunities do these bring up on the editing side? Hmm. That's, that's a great question. Um, uh, Cause you're absolutely right uh, for, each of these three books, there's a completely dis different uh, creative process in place. So like for The High Republic, that's definitely a, a Lucasfilm-led initiative that has so many different publishers um, involved in it. So there's just a lot of coordination, a lot of communication that has to happen on that. Um, I have a, a special email folder just for The High Republic in order to track all that to make sure we're all keeping on the same page. Um, and, and like Tom mentioned with FACPOV, a book that starts with an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and uh, Dooku Jedi Lost, we get to work with our amazing audiobook team uh, at Penguin Random House. We're kind of, uh, don't tell them I tell, told you this, but like just best in class. I think they make the best audiobooks out there. Don't worry, there. nobody's going to see this. No, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank God. <laughs> uh, but I think what, what is common to all three of those experiences is we just get to work with the most exceptional teams, whether it's Lucasfilm, whether it's our audiobook group, and whether it's a giant group of 43 authors. Um, we, uh, I, I would like to think I'm okay at my job. Tom is amazing at his job, but uh, they're even better. They're just uh, such a delight to work with and they, um, they make us look good. Yeah, and the, I mean, the other thing about this question that I liked and wanted to talk about is that it highlights one of the more important things if anyone out there aspires to be an editor one day, a Star Wars editor or otherwise, is that a really big part of being an editor is not just sitting there with the pages in front of you and you know making notes on better use of grammar or you know suggestions for different vocab or hey here's a cool easter egg kind of thing a lot of being an editor is being really good at organizing projects and communicating and managing mm. groups of people and bringing them together and a lot of times we talk about that with talking about the different parts of publishing of its production and marketing and publicity and all that but with these projects in particular, there's that extra layer of organizing between the needs that the audio team has because the actual script screenplay, more or less, that's being developed has to be written in such a way that they can give audio direction off of it, but also we need to deliver a story um, versus FACPOV, which as you said, is just doing the same thing that you do, but 43 times and all at once or 40 times and all at once. So it really, it highlights that being an editor is very much just being about an organized person with organized to the extent that you can be and being good at managing projects. Um, so that's, that's really the thing that those projects and those books and those initiatives highlight is you have to really be on top of it because the fun thing, but also the hard thing about being an editor is you are the center of that storm. You are at the heart of that maelstrom all the time and you're constantly like pulling people all together into one, one center area where hopefully everything comes together. Um, and it just ends up being more so in those projects. But like you mentioned, we get to work with really cool people. So it's not really Absolutely. all that hard. Um, and when things get really difficult to continue the storm metaphor much further than it needed to go, um, <laughs> no, the, there are plenty of people around to, to, to help us out with that. To batten down the hatches. That's there what you're going to say. Perfect. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Nailed so, it. Yeah, yeah. Wow. We should work in publishing, Tom. We we're should. so good at words. This is, this is why we're not on camera like ever. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> uh, and then I think we have one last question yes. um, from Sarah at SEH221 asks, Tom and Elizabeth, what's your favorite part of the publishing process? Uh, all right. So I think we both cheated because I can see our notes. I think we both cheated and we gave two things. Um, but anyway, um, why don't you, you get to go first. This time. Okay. Uh, my very favorite thing is I love book release day. I love logging on to the internet uh, that morning and this thing that we've been working on for sometimes years is finally in people's hands and just getting to see all the responses and uh, how excited people are getting to see, you know, you've been thinking about how great that one scene is for forever and then seeing someone else say, yeah, that one scene, it's great. Um, that is just so much fun. Even the constructive criticism I think is really helpful. Um, I like reading that stuff too because um, we always want our books to be uh, each book better than the last. Yeah. Um, so yeah, really stay. And the other great thing about reader response is like you and I have had the great luxury of 
through conventions and all these other places, getting to know a lot of our different readers, some of them closely enough that like we know certain readers who like <laughs> a certain character or an aesthetic mm -hmm. or something like means so much to them. And so when we get a book and the author has written a scene with a particular character or with a particular turn of phrase, like there are sometimes I'll read a finished book and I'll be like, I can't wait for, and I'm thinking of like a specific person, like a specific one of our readers. I'm mm -hmm. like, I cannot wait to see their reaction. Like I can't wait to talk to them about it, which is even better and, and just speaks to how much um, fun we have hanging out with our readers. Um, but for me, it sort of, it comes down to like two things. The first one is when we get to make a book offer to an author for their first Star Wars book for the first time, and we get to email someone or talk to them through their agent or get on the phone up and say, hey, we, you know, we may have been talking for a while about doing Star Wars because maybe they reached out to us and we just were looking for that right project, or we heard Star Wars was a huge thing for them, and we get to say, hey, do you want to come tell a Star Wars story with us? Do you want to come build a snowman? You know, <laughs> um, And the, the reactions and the kind of like, those little private moments that we get to spend with them when we get to talk about like how much Star Wars has meant to them and now they get to help contribute in you know a small part to, to a story in Star Wars is really fun. It's really special. Um, it's really cool. Um, but then, and this is very specific to the job that, that we do together, is the first time that we, our team, sits down when we have a brand new manuscript in. Um, and the reason is, to, to, to give the readers at home a little insight of this, is what will happen is after we've all read it for the first time or the first couple of times, if we've read it several times, we'll all sit down in a room together and kind of just talk out the book from page one to page 400. And someone will sort of take the lead in like narrating the book and be like, all right, so then this happens you know, and then Thrawn goes over here and he does this, and then this thing happens over here. And we'll just talk through it, but it's almost like we're talking through having just come out of a Star Wars film because A, we'll be mm -hmm. making jokes. B, we'll be pointing out the things that we really love, the funny things, the things that made us kind of like, you know, the things that really excited us, the things that caught us off guard. And through that, we'll also start to talk about like, here's the places where the book still needs some work. Here's the places where the pacing's just off or the character is not right heading. But it's so much fun because we basically take that experience of sitting around talking about Star Wars, which we do all the time. And we have now professionalized it in talking about these <laughs> books. Um, and it's fun too, because as Elizabeth, as you know, being an editor, sometimes you are just kind of sitting alone with your headphones on or sitting alone in the corner in a, mm -hmm. you know, an otherwise empty room, just click, 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 click at the, at the keyboard, typing up notes. So actually bringing it into like this team environment, this big collaborative, like just basically hangout, editorial hangout is the most fun. Also, and we always get great snacks. Oh. Great. Best snacks, yeah. Always. Nobody, nobody. Star Wars is alone. I think uh, <laughs> that's true. Definitely. Nobody Star Wars is alone. <laughs> we, that's the title of the panel. Done. Done. Look at that. Nobody Star Wars is alone. Even when you're at home, yeah. you're not Star Warsing alone. As hopefully this panel has proven. Uh, well, thanks so much for hanging out with us, guys. And um, yeah, if you want to hear more about the Afro announcement, go over to StarWars.com uh, and check it out. And there's uh, all the details are there. And um, yeah, let us know if you like this panel and uh, we might have more of these for you in the future. Yeah, and you know, let us know what other kinds of panels you wanna see or if you always if you have more questions, things you want us to talk about, we're always happy to do that. Um, if you ever need anything from us, ever wanna chat with us about anything, send us feedback, catch us on Facebook at the Star Wars books page or at Delray Star Wars on um, Instagram and Twitter. Um, we're always hanging out on there. Um, probably when we should be doing other things, um, but it's so much fun to Ever. chat with our readers. So um, yeah, thanks everyone. We hope everyone's doing really well. We're sorry that we won't see many of you at conventions um, right now or into the summer, but uh, we are um, hoping that everyone is safe and happy um, there at home. And uh, you know, we may be apart, but we're, we're still hanging out together, you know, connected through the force, surrounds us, binds us, all those good things. Yeah, um, if I could do a Yoda voice, I would do it, but I can't. Leave that to Mark Thompson. Leave that to Mark Thompson. Uh, <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. Stay thanks safe everyone. out there. Bye.